Members, uh, we're, we've got three bills we're going to hear, and then we're going to do a walkthrough of the DE amendment um, with the roadmap of Wednesday being more of the markup bill, or markup day for uh, the budget bill that we put together here, both some policy and supplemental finance. And so uh, just to give everybody kind of a roadmap of how we're, we plan to go and to the audience, uh, uh, I don't think we'll get to testimony on the DE. Perhaps we'll get some feedback from the department uh, today if we have time. So we'll try to keep moving along as quick as we can uh, with the bills we want to hear and then uh, the, the rollout. And then uh, Wednesday we'd have additional testimony and uh, markup of the DE and discussion members. So that's kind of the lay lay of the land. Uh, members, one more update for the committee. Uh, you heard me on the floor probably today talk about uh, the very unfortunate news, uh, news we are not totally surprised at uh, given what we've been watching for weeks with the high path avian flu influ influenza uh, that's been uh, coming from the east up the Mississippi Flyway, been in Iowa, South Dakota, Wisconsin uh, weeks prior. Uh, last weekend, uh, I've heard that there's at least three confirmed sites, uh, two in central Minnesota and one in southern Minnesota. And so uh, members uh, just want to bring your attention to that. I know the Board of Animal Health and the Department of Agriculture are on, uh, on the ground uh, prepared and watching for this. Uh, we've uh, had emergency funds uh, authorized in prior budgets. And so uh, we're just going to continue to watch this and make, be as responsive as we can. And so I just uh, want to make everybody aware of that as we uh, keep our uh, poultry farmers and, uh, in, in mind and uh, uh, hope, hope uh, that this um, can be eradicated very soon. But uh, very, very troubling times for those that are affected with this um, high path influenza. And so uh, it is here in Minnesota, so we want to pay extra close attention as well. So with that, uh, members, I, I'm going to turn the gavel over to Gary. Our Senator Dames and uh, get started with the first bill uh, so we can move through our agenda. Good afternoon, members. Uh, today, the first bill we have is Senate File 4280. That's Senator Westrom's uh, Senate file. It uh, relates to regulated animal possession prohibitions and requirements exemption modification. Senator Westrom, I understand that you do not have any, any amendments. Senator Westrom, would you like to move that your bill be heard and laid over? Mr. Chair, I would uh, do that, uh, move the bill for consideration and possible inclusion in the Ag Omnibus Bill. Senator Wester moves that Senate File 4280 be held for possible consideration and possibly laid over for the Omnibus Bill at the end. Senator Wester, two cent your comments on Senate File 4280. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, this bill came to me uh, from a constituent in my district, uh, central Minnesota, uh, the Hemker Zoo, which is a... Uh, private zoo in uh, Minnesota, just a, a beautiful, enjoyable place for uh, many uh, customers, visitors uh, throughout the uh, spring, summer, and early fall months uh, in, uh, in central Minnesota. It uh, draws people in from, from very far around, and um, uh, I've talked to many people that have been there, and they've, they've raved about how nice of a zoo and uh, how unique and how great it is to be able to have that in a small town of Freeport. Uh, former uh, Representative Bud Heidgerken talked to me some weeks back about this issue and concern and uh, there's kind of two concerns of uh, members and then I want to turn it over to the owner and the testifiers to uh, let them tell you a little bit more because I know our time is limited. But uh, just recently uh, as the Sheriff's Department has, who oversees this uh, has had contacted the zoo, there's an exemption for uh, zoo to uh, be able to uh, host a certain amount of monkeys, uh, which this zoo has, and uh, 
consideration was given, they were giving to uh, bringing in some, some uh, cats or, or uh, tiger cubs. And uh, as they were going through the process with the sheriff's department, uh, it came to their attention or uh, the situation that uh, the state law allows an accredited zoo, uh, typically a public zoo accredited by uh, the AZAA Association to um, house uh, monkeys or additional monkeys or cats, but not, um, not a zoo that's a private zoo accredited by a ZAA, the Zoological um, America, uh, I'll let her, I forget the, the Zoological Association that does the accrediting for this zoo. And uh, so members, uh, this brought the, 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 the logical uh, solution uh, with the Sheriff's Department and uh, the Hemkers and the others involved was to allow or change state law to allow this accreditation to also be a zoo that could uh, ho host uh, more monkeys and uh, more cats. And so uh, uh, that's, that's the reason this bill is in front of us to continue with the opportunity, the enjoyment and the uh, experience that they offer so many Minnesotans in central Minnesota. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, turn it over to the testifiers so they can give you just a little bit more exact uh, details and uh, the need for this bill and this, this, uh, uh, these few words uh, of exemption in state statute. Well, thank you, Senator Western, for your opening comments. And uh, uh, members, uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and hear the testifiers, and then we will open it up for questions. And to let the testifiers know, we'd like to have you keep your comments to three minutes uh, per testifier. We do have quite a few testifiers today on various bills. So with that said, if Joan Hemker would please come forward to the... Thank Joan, you, I believe you're going to join us by Zoom. That's great. I am. Uh, good afternoon. And if you could state your name and who you represent and proceed with your testimony, we would appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Westrom, Agricultural and Rural Development Finance and Policy Committee for hearing my testimony today. My name is Joan Hemker, founder and owner of Hemker Park and Zoo, an accredited facility of the Zoological Association of America. And I am here today to expre express my support for the Minnesota Statute SF4280, an amendment to, to the regulated animal statute, Minnesota 346.155. Hemker Park and Zoo HPZ started in 1977 and has been, an accredited, has been accredited with ZAA since 2013. Hemker Zoo is important to our surrounding com communities in Minnesota as we are over 100 miles from other accredited zoos. Many schools, children, and their families can not afford to travel that far to receive the same education and conservation message we are teaching here. Conservation is extremely important to us as we work with the Dyer Island Conservation Trust for penguins and the International Rhino Foundation and other foundations. Since the Minnesota Statute 346.155 was set in place in 2005, Hemker Park and Zoo has had regulated animals. However, since a new interpretation of Minnesota 346.155 statute with the local animal control authority, HPZ is no longer allowed to bring in any new regulated animals and will be held to the current in inventory. This statute is prohibiting our facility from growing and allowing us to do the work we have been doing since it was founded in 1977. Further, the current law exempts organizations that have no accreditation standards as most sanctuaries do not have to even be a USDA licensed. Circuses and fairs only have to meet the minimum requirements. The passage of SF4280 will simply correct an unjust bias in the law as well as amplify the need for current animal owners to achieve the higher standard of animal welfare and public safety that organizations like ZAA and AZA demand of their accredited institutions. There is opposition to adding ZAA to the law. Please note the information you are receiving from the opposing side is in fact untrue. The inclusion of ZAA in the law will not contribute to the influx of any additional animals into the state, no more than AZA 
or wildlife sanctuaries exempt creates. All facilities will occasionally be found to have minor USDA violations such as dirty water dishes, spider webs, or buckets that are on the ground, including AZA accredited facilities, which can be easily substantiated upon request. Hemker Park and Zoos supports and requests the amendment of Minnesota Statute 346.155 to add the Zoological Association of America to be exempt along with AZA accredited facilities. As ZAA holds an extremely high bar with respect to professional animal standards, focuses on staff, animal, and public safety. The accreditation program may maintains a benchmark for standards of operation and surpasses the standards of state minimum requirements and the federally mandated USDA APHIS Animal Welfare Act. Affording AZA an exemption from Minnesota 346.155 will exclude this while excluding ZAA, an alternative accrediting organization. If you could start wrapping it up, ma'am. Yep, I am that has been in place for over 17 years is problematic from a legal perspective. The Equal Pro Protection Clause of the United States Con Constitution requires state governmental bodies to treat an individual in the same manner as others. Um, when you vote, I just ask that you consider the families and the young children that are able to come to this zoo and think about not by not accrediting us, you are, you are altering our business. On behalf of Hempcare Park and Zoo, an accredited facility with ZAA, I thank you for taking the time. Thank you, ma'am. And next we have the Executive Director for the Zoological Association of America. And Good afternoon, committee members and honorable senators. My name is John Sejaga. I am the Executive Director of the Zoological Association of America. And the Zoological Association of America is in support of SF4280, an amendment to the Animal Possession, Prohibition, and Requirement Statutes in the state of Minnesota. Zoological Association of America is a zoological trade association that represents professionally managed zoos, aquarium, conservation breeding facilities, wildlife conservation ranches, and conservation education-based animal ambassador programs. With more than 60 accredited institution members, ZAA is the second largest uh, trade association in the zoological sector in North America, representing some of the finest zoos in the United States, like Fort Worth, San Antonio, Hemka Park, Tanganyika Wildlife Park, Wildlife World Zoo and Aquarium, and the Monterey uh, Zoological uh, Society. ZAA has a very stringent uh, process of accreditation. Um, we accredit, we are, our accreditation has an extremely high bar with respect to professional animal standards. Uh, we look at animal care and welfare and focus on staff, animal guests, animal and guest safety, animal care, welfare, husbandry, state and federal compliance, veterinary care, nutrition, enrichment, security, facility maintenance, record keeping, and we review policies and procedures and protocols. The accreditation program maintains a benchmark of standards of operation that surpass the USDA. With over 34 pages in the application process that requires membership to supply all their policies and protocols, mainly for acquisition and disposition, ZAA monitors the coming of animals, the going, the sales and safety protocols uh, in, uh, uh, safety with the public, safety with the staff at all our institutions. Our accreditation process takes about two to three days and two inspectors, a minimum of two inspectors to do our accreditation. Neither ZAA nor AZA are regulatory agencies. All animal facilities open to the public, regardless of accreditation status, and uh, are regulated by the federal USDA APHIS. Uh, ZAA has the highest safety record. Uh, if you look at our re re uh, safety policies, you will see that we have policies for venomous animals, large cats, large and dangerous animals, which we call class one animals, uh, hippos, hyenas, uh, elephants, 
um, tigers, lions, all of those animals. And we always have a body system with those animals. Regardless of what accreditation of an institution has, they must abide by all state and federal regulations, including, in this case, the Minnesota Department of Wildlife. Uh, under the Equal Protection Clause of the United States uh, Constitution, it requires that state and government bodies to treat an individual in the same manner as others in the similar conditions and circumstances. Singling out the ZAA and not having them uh, get the same accord as given by the AZA is unfair. ZAA is on par with the AZA. We have a lot of our institutions which are dual accredited. We have dual accreditation, both having AZA and ZAA at the same time, like Fort Worth, San Antonio, Downtown Aquarium, Denver in Houston, and the Pittsburgh Zoo. Uh, with that in mind, the uh, singling out one organization for exemption while denying the same for an organization that also has independent, robust standards of inspection and oversight violates ZAA's right to equal protection under the law. Uh, ZAA supports Minnesota SF4280, and we ask that you give the ZAA the same accord as is, accre as is given to the ZAA. Already this, uh, amend this um, statute exempts uh, circuses and traveling animal acts that enter the state of Minnesota. And here you have uh, an accredited agency that is on par with the ZAA that is very stringent with the highest safety record and it's not given the accord of the same exemption as AZA. So ZAA would like you to consider, uh, committee members, to consider adding ZAA to this amendment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. We do appreciate it. Next, we have the executive director for the Animal Park at the Conservatory Center. Good afternoon, Chair Westrom and distinguished committee members. I'll thank you for allowing we me to We can hear today. you, but we can't see you. There we go. No better. Okay, thank you. And um, welcome to the committee. To be heard. I'm Southern, but I'll do my best to speak quickly. My name is Mindy Stenner, and today I'm speaking on behalf of the ZAA. I'm here to express my support for SF4280 to amend the regulated animal statute and to exempt ZAA accredited facilities from the prohibition on zoo growth and development. The current statute restricts most zoos owning any wild cats, bears, or non-human primates to possessing whatever they owned in 2005. They can replace individual animals they lose, but not step outside that footprint. To be clear, if they had 50 tigers in 2005, they can continue to have 50 tigers forever, but not 51. And they cannot add a single bobcat unless they didn't have it in 2005. Everyone knows that people visit a local zoo repeatedly to see things that are new or different. In the existing statute, exempting AZA accredited zoos and restricting all other zoos in the state by limiting their growth and development this statute is effectively creating an AZA accredited zoo monopoly. The AZA generally consists of well-funded facilities, mostly in large urban centers, that can afford multi-million dollar exhibits and staff to run massive research projects. As a co-author of one of the AZA's husbandry manuals and regular contributor to the veterinary research project, I support these projects, these collaborations between zoos across the US, and it's wonderful that large institutions can afford to dedicate staff to these projects. The much younger ZAA has accredited zoos that tend to serve rural, often less affluent or more sparsely populated areas. They afford the children and families in those areas the same animal conservation and welfare message that people in more affluent communities have access to, and they deserve that. ZAA accredited zoos provide this service while still instituting strong programs of animal welfare and public safety, and they should be able to execute planned growth and exhibit new animals of interest to their communities. Prohibiting them from flourishing is like fully funding only the largest universities and keeping the more local college systems locked into the funding levels and technology from 17 years ago in 2005 when the fortunate among us had blackberries and flip phones. Both types of zoo have value, they're different from each other, but both bring enormous benefit to their communities. The 2004 bill that removed dangerous animals as pets appears to have had quite an impact. Yet a quick review of issues in Minnesota since 2005 revealed two mountain lion injuries to the public after they crossed barriers, a wolf escape, the escape of a polar bear and two seals, a tiger bite of staff, three escaped gorillas and a grizzly bear that smashed a glass panel containing it. And all of that occurred at AZA accredited zoos. 
which under this statute have a blanket exemption. An incident can occur anywhere, and practices enforced by the USDA and expanded upon by accrediting groups dictate that zoos put processes in place to help prevent and solve these problems. In the current existing statute, there's an exemption for wildlife sanctuaries defined as conducting no commercial activities. That means no public visitors are allowed at any time, even for education or fundraising. Sanctuaries house as many animals as they choose, of any species they choose, living out their lives on the generosity of the public. The USDA doesn't license non-commercial private facilities. According to the definition of the statute, there is no external oversight required for sanctuaries. The current statute also exempts businesses that are transitory as part of a circus, carnival, rodeo, or fair. These are all USDA licensed exhibitors regulated by the federal government through unannounced inspections designed to ensure animal welfare and public safety. Permanent zoo facilities in the state operating under the exact same license make an important contribution to the communities they live in. They attract tourism, hire staff, and run retail establishments like gift shops. These zoos are licensed by the USDA through an inspection process designed to ensure public safety and welfare. This not only provides some external review of facilities and staff qualifications, but it puts them at least on par with the existing exemption for transitory animal exhibits with the same license. Yet they're prohibited from any growth and development and a delineation that appears both arbitrary and capricious. Henker Zoo is the only institution in the state that has also successfully sought accreditation by the ZAA. An independent group of professional zoo industry specialists assessed this location, took its measure according to established best practices, and found this to be an excellent facility. Can you start wrapping it up, ma'am? Yes, sir. ZAA accredited facilities should be considered as far exceeding the standards otherwise established by this statute. Exempting ZAA accredited facilities with their third party inspection process is clearly the right choice. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. And next we have the founder and executive director of the Wildcat Sanctuary. Thank you, um, Chair Westrom and community members. My and name thank is you Tammy for joining Keith. us, ma'am. And if you could state oh, your name and who you represent and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tammy Thies and I am the executive director at the Wildcat Sanctuary here in Sandstone, Minnesota. We are an accredited sanctuary. That means we don't buy, breed or sell animals. That is correct. What was incorrect is that we are licensed by the United States Department of Agricultural, just like the other zoos in our states. And we also have strict standards and we're accredited by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Um, none of us want to shut down or make it so that young uh, teenagers and children can't learn from these wonderful rural zoos. What we want to do it in is a safe way uh, that is safe for the public going there, especially because they are in rural locations where we know first responders have a lot more time uh, away to respond. But the other thing is we want to talk about is that after 20 years of being immersed in this rescue of the displaced cats, I have to ask myself, why is this being brought forward now when our current law already provides a path for these smaller local zoos to possess regulated animals? The path to the AZA accreditation is achievable. It provides applicants with an AZA mentor. It is not $50,000 like I saw in the Minnesota Post article. Um, actually, when I looked it up, the annual membership is, uh, let's see, is as low as $8,000 and it's $1,500 for an application for accreditation. Uh, with more research, I saw that there's many, many small zoos accredited by AZA across the country, including some that is small and has three and five acres. So uh, it's definitely achievable. Unfortunately, ZA accredited facilities around the country um, have been cited by the USDA, which is minimum standards of care, including um, being warned and fined by authorities for unsafe handling of animals, inadequate public safety barriers, animal escapes, and enclosure repair. And we did provide a document, I know there's some research there, listing those facilities that are ZAA accredited that have not met the standards of the USDA. Um, ZAA exemption is much broader than what we're talking about today, a nice little zoo getting a few animals. Um, it is 
a big implication to our state. It means any existing or new facility, local zoo, or private menagerie in our entire state could potentially acquire, house, breed, and sell a limited number of dangerous big cats, bears, and primates. For example, just since yesterday, it was reported that a second zoo is now already seeking ZAA status for this ex explicit exemption. And how many more will follow suit? The volume of dangerous apex predators in our state is sure to increase and pose a significant safety issue. You know, Keith Straff, who's an investigator for the Humane Society here in Minnesota, the Animal Humane Society, was one that was a first responder on so many of those attacks, escapes, bites, and illegal wildlife trafficking that happened here prior to the 2005 animal regulator law. And most recently, he submitted a letter, and I loved the quote, I have never had to see an exotic animal in the 16 years since the regulated law went into effect. You know, there's some other things we want to, to know is that ZNA, ZAA has kept saying that their standards are the same as AZA, but then why time and time again, when a zoo fails AZA accreditation, ZAA accredits them. They talk about dual membership, but actually there's less than 10 zoos that have dual membership out of the 238 AZA accredited facilities. So that's not anything to tout about. You know, it wasn't even till the spring of 2020, right before Tiger King aired on Netflix, that ZAA ended cub petting and public photo ops by their members. Many members didn't even know that they adopted that. If you would wrap it up, ma'am. Um, and one of those characters on uh, Tiger King was Doc Antle, who was prosecuted for wildlife trafficking and only right before the documentary aired was he no longer ZAA accredited. Uh, there's been other places like Texas, Louisiana, Michigan, and California that have also um, denied ZAA exemption. So I'm asking you today to please oppose SF4280 for the ZAA exemption. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you, ma'am. And next we have the animal curator and intern coordinator for Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refugee. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Westrom and committee members, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Emily McCormack. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Zoology, and I am the animal curator at Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge, which is an Arkansas sanctuary. Also, we don't buy, sell, breed, trade animals that currently cares for 87 rescued big cats and 10 bear. Our facility is accredited by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, and I'm testifying today as well as the vice chair of the Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance. The Alliance stands in strong support of our Minnesota member sanctuary, the Wildcat Sanctuary, in opposing the Senate File 4280, which would exempt the ZAA from the current law that restricts the possession of big cats and bears and primates. Um, you know, to my understanding, that you, your, your law that went into effect in 2005 um, has, been, has been serving a purpose and doing a job. So, um, I don't see a, a, a reason that you would want to kind of rewind time and allow some of these other smaller private menageries that are, are getting ZAA accreditation to be allowed back into your state. Um, our member sanctuaries have been rescuing wild animals for decades and it's become very familiar with the industry. My, myself, I have 23 years experience in rescuing. And the industry out there has created such a need for sanctuaries to even have to exist. In fact, sanctuaries like ours and um, Tammy, please, our colleagues, you know, our mission is to one day not have to exist because these animals shouldn't be put in the situations that they have been. Um, we recognize practices that have raised a lot of red flags and we see those red flags in some current and former ZAA facilities. And as uh, Ms. Thies mentioned, you know, um, ZAA just changed uh, the cub petting industry right before the Tiger King came out, and we've seen um, a lot from that. In fact, a lot of us sanctuaries had an influx of animals just from some facilities that were shut down since the, the airing of the Tiger King. So um, I would, I would, in, in my opinion, and, and uh, stick to your current law, you wisely chose um, only to exempt exhibitors accredited by the AZA, um, and in, in doing so just ensures that uh, Tigers can be kept at facilities that can meet the highest standards, which AZA has, and everyone's given an opportunity in order to get those, to make those standards, and uh, ha they have the help provided in, in doing so. So, you know, take advantage of that mentorship 
we have animals in cap in a captive environment. Let's let's reach the highest standard, and and there shouldn't be anybody that doesn't want to do that. It not only gives the animals that are in captive life great animal welfare care, uh, but it also has a lot to do with our public safety. Um, we don't want to weaken your law, um, and it also create a burden on sanctuaries. You know, we see a lot of these facilities that go above and beyond financially what they can even handle. And so a lot of them end up um, closing, you know, just a care of one big cat can cost up to $20,000 a year. And so then a closure comes and where do all these poor animals go? Um, so I, um, you know, I think that uh, you guys did a great thing in 2005. Um, I would keep your law in existence and, um, and stick with what's been going well for you. You don't wanna have this risk out there of um, creating, you know, more exotic animals in your own state. You know, when there has been escapes or maulings, um, some as recent as in the last five years, you know, OSHA comes in and starts investigating. And OSHA always consults with the AZA, not ZAA. You know, and so some of these things we do need to look into. Um, we, um, you know, please oppose SF4280. Um, you know, I think what you have going already in your state is is perfectly um, good for you. And uh, I applaud that, that law being passed in 2005. And um, just really, when you go to consider this, think about public safety and animal welfare and the standards that can always be achieved. We can always be greater. Thank you. Well, thank you, ma'am. Uh, members, uh, any questions for the testifiers or for Senator Westrom? Senator Prince. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Wester. My guess as we look at ZAA accredited places, what's the main obstacle to them seeking the accreditation of the AZA? Is it money? Is it regulatory? If you could say a little bit more about that, Senator, I think that'd be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Senator Wester, would you like to answer that, or would you have one of the testifiers? Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd let uh, one of the testifiers answer that uh, for starters, Senator Prince. So if we could have one of the testifiers. Uh, Probably Ms. Hemker or whoever wants to. I would like John to address that. Uh, yes, go ahead, Ms. Emker. Um, could John, could you address that? Un unmuted, right. Um, I will answer that. The, the choice is, well, there are two different organizations. They work parallel to each other, but one is about governance and one is about animal care. We, ZAA is still big with animal care. There's a difference in pricing, yes, but one, AZA is all about governance. AZA wants, their, their, their uh, fees are based on a percentage of your operating budget. Therefore, they, you have to declare to the AZA what your overall financial income is, how much money you spend, how much money you make, how much money you bring in, where your sources of money is coming from and they will take a percentage of that. Whereas ZA has a flat fee, which is based on your number of employees, full-time employees, 32 hours and over. That's one of the difference. Otherwise, we are on par, it's the same regulations, it's similar regulations, similar um, uh, inspections, similar uh, requirements for the two institutions. All it is, is just about the money that AZA requires for their uh, accreditation. Some of these small schools just can't afford it. Follow up, Senator Prince. Senator Murphy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And following Senator Prince's line of questioning, are there, in addition to the AZA and ZAA accreditation, are there standards uh, that guide those two bodies? Are there either federal or state laws that guide these two bodies? Or is the regulation of uh, the facilities that we're talking about left to the ZAA and the AZA independent of, uh, of either federal or state law. John, would you like to answer that? Yes. Both AZA and ZAA are not federal regulatory agencies. The regulatory agency that overrides all of us, all facilities open to the public that keep animals, is the USDA APHIS. We have regulations in conjunction. We, we say you must meet state, federal, and local regulations. That means your city ordinance, your state ordinance, and the USDA. Then 
you have to be in compliance with ZAA um, uh, standards, our accreditation standards. And we have uh, uh, accreditation standards and we have space requirements for keeping animals in captivity. Same thing for AZ. Senator Murphy, follow up? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I really appreciate that, sir. Um, that's a helpful uh, explanation for me. Uh, and so following along Senator Frentz's uh, line of questioning, I understand and appreciate the difference in the fee structures that just you're describing or the governance differences that you're describing. But what I don't really understand yet is the material difference between the accreditation by AZA or ZAA. Um, and it would be helpful if either you could share that with me in summary or maybe Ms. McCormick or someone else could share that as well, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Murphy. And uh, John, if you'd like to take a stab at that, and then maybe Ms. McCormick would also like to respond. The accreditation standards almost mirror each other. And once you get into the standards, you have to meet a certain amount of compliance in your protocols for safety, for animal welfare, for enrichment, for animal acquisition, disposition, ambassador animals, um, how you treat your animals, how you house your animals, how you keep your animals, your program of veterinary care, all these things you have to meet. And that is in conjunction with what you already met with the USDA and, and APHIS. So it's a second layer, it's a higher tier to make sure that you are just not meeting the very bare minimum as is required by the United States Department of Agriculture. It's something to strive for, for um, uh, betterment for the animals in captivity, and it's something that the two agencies um, have that work parallel to each other. Thank you, John. Uh, Ms. McCormick, are you still with us, and would you like to respond? Yes, thanks, I'm still here. Um, you know, I, I can tell you a real quick big difference. Um, AZA, there's at least 118 pages of um, standards and requirements for accreditation. I, ZAA, maybe 30, 33 pages. So just in the page numbers, there clearly is some difference in um, the standards that are required in order for accreditation uh, besides, um, you know, following USDA laws, which are very minimal standards, I guess I would say in my opinion, and I'm sure others in the industry. Thank you. Ms. Tice, I, un I see you had your hand up. Would you like to respond? Yes. Um, the other thing is that any exemption exempts from the state law. So on top of, yes, being open to the public, or we're not open to the public, we're still USD licensed, which is minimum standards. This exemption ex exempts them from all of the ad additional stuff that our law has, that has posted signs, um, notifying of escape, having first response protocol, unless it is in those guidelines. But like I said, AZA is much stricter and has a track record since 1924 of enforcing their accreditation where with some of the documents we sent, you can see if, if the USDA isn't even being met in most cases, and not the small things that um, Ms. Hempker talked about, because that's true. We're talking about critical violations. Um, that's what is concerning to me, that ZAA doesn't have the same track record as enforcement of their guidelines as ADA. Ms. Murphy, Senator Murphy, follow up. Members, other questions? Members, other questions? Uh, seeing no other questions, Senator Westrom renews his motion that Senate File 4280 be laid over for possible inclusion. All, so Senator Westrom, Senator for, Senate File 4280 is laid over. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, and uh, thank you to the testifiers. I appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Next, we have Senate File 3841, Senator Hur. Senator Goggin, would you move that Senate File 3841 be uh, heard and, po and possibly laid over for inclusion? So moved, Mr. Chair. Senator Herr, your bill has been moved to be discussed and laid over for possible inclusion. If you would like to go ahead and uh, 
present Senate File 3841. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you to uh, Senator, uh, Chair Senator Westrom and members as well for giving me the opportunity to hear Senate uh, File 3841. We all know that there is a shortage of farmers in our state for many reasons, and we are trying to fill that gap, especially when there's great disproportion between the 25% minorities in our state and less than 1% of Minnesota communities of color that run or operate farming businesses. At the same time, we know that Minnesotans are experiencing food insecurity. Data show that one in 10 people in Minnesota and one in 10 children are experiencing food insecurity. And more exclusively, the percent the percentage doubles in our community of colors or BIPOC communities. I have served in this community in the past and know that it is intentional for this community to find solution to, to fill our state farmers shortage and create opportunities to get food to students and families and empower growers in our state. Senate File 3841 is one of the missing link to close the gap as well as offer opportunity to our African growers and food producer. Mr. Chair and members, Senate File 3841 asks for an appropriation to the Department of Agriculture to support African growers and producer alliance and African American urban agriculture initiatives to address fresh food access and food desert in our communities. I have several testifiers today, and they will introduce themselves before presenting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. My name is Ngozi Akubike. I am with Agapa. Agapa is an African Growers and Producers Alliance. And um, we are an alliance representing farming groups of African farmers and growers of African descent, Afri African American Urban Agricultural Initiatives. We have farmers across Minnesota in Cambridge, Lionel Lakes, Cochrane, St. St. Croix, Silver Lake, and Marine. And we are asking for your support for this bill. There are two million in the fiscal year of 2022 and two million in the fiscal year of 2023 from the general fund to the Commission of Agriculture to, pro to provide grants to African growers and producers alliance and African American urban agricultural initiatives that will address fresh food access and food deserts in African American community. This is a one-time appropriation that we are asking, and um, we are asking that it, it doesn't cancel till June 30, 2026. And why are we asking for this? Um, currently, based on the legislative report in 2020, Minnesota can only claim 39 black-owned farms. And black farms are holding by a thread across the nation. Majority of us grew up as farmers before immigrating to this place. However, when we came here, we experienced um, issues of equity and access. Um, in terms of uh, startup cost, equipment, borehole, water, irrigation, fencing, we do not have access to stable, affordable land. Land, we are not talking about land in terms of ownership. We are talking about land to farm, um, to rent so that we can farm. We, there is a stringent regulations pertaining to loans and um, the distance to land. Most of us from the Twin Cities, we travel from here to Cambridge in order to farm. 
and there are issues of drought. If we look at the slide number four, we, you can see one of us with a bucket of water on the head. That is not the um, effective and efficient way for, uh, for someone to farm. We have a lack of representation and advocacy for black farmers. And there is also the need for greenhouses. Where we came from, it's um, a hot climate. They come in here, it's uh, very cold, and uh, we, we find it difficult to understand how to farm utilizing uh, based on the current climate that we have here. And so we are asking for your support so that this uh, fund will be given to the MDA. Um, it's not coming to AGAPA. AGAPA is the uh, short name for African Growers and um, African Americans uh, Alliance so that um, they can provide uh, funding. What do we need this for? We need it to provide technical assistance, training, culturally technical support for existing farmers as they access farming resources. We need full-time staff. Uh, we need people to work with MDA. I know that MDA has an emerging farmer office, but they do not have the resources to meet with all the farmers in the various locations where they are. Uh, we need African farming outreach to Minnesota, for Minnesota farming community. We need farmland for, to rent. And how does this benefit Minnesota? When we have uh, healthy food, we grow a culturally responsive uh, food. It provides access to healthy living. When people eat healthy food, it translates to healthy lifestyle, and uh, it will reduce the um, reliance on the health care, especially pertaining to issues like diabetes and other things. Um, it will increase food security and equity. There will be less dependence on the government for food assistance. And people also will have a source of income that will sustain them so that there will be less dependence on government resources. So we are asking um, for your support so that uh, uh, African growers, that missing link that the uh, our senator said is missing, this is the time to close that gap. It's the time to recognize that there are African farmers in Minnesota. And it's been a long while uh, recognizing the inequity in access. And we are hoping that um, you will grant us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next, we'll have the owner of Dawn to Dusk Farm. And if you would go ahead and state your name, who you represent, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair and distinguished community members. Uh, my name is Moses Mumanyi. I am a farmer in Cambridge, Minnesota. I came to this country in 2004. Two years after that, I ended up uh, growing uh, at community gardens, I moved to Stillwater in uh, Big River Farms in Stillwater, trained there, and then uh, seven years later, I was able to buy my own farm through the farm ownership loan uh, from the USDA. Um, I, after that, I have been uh, farming uh, and selling uh, produce, vegetables at the farmer's market um, uh, in uh, Minneapolis. In 2020, uh, after seven, uh, 12 years of selling vegetables, we felt like uh, we needed to see more of our community, uh, like people who looked like us. So we knew of friends that were still gardening in community plots. We opened up our farm. Uh, we thought we were going to have maybe four or five. We ended up with 13 farmers driving all the way to Cambridge from the Twin Cities in 2020. In 2021, which is last year, we had over 20 people, and there's still more that are interested that are coming to Cambridge. I give them a quarter acre each. I mentor them on everything I do. And last year, we had uh, one farmer sell at the farmer's market because of that. We had over 10 farmers sell to the uh, local food hubs, the Good Acre, the Food Group, uh, the Second Heartland Harvest. Um, we also ended up, me and my wife, renting more acreage in uh, Lino Lakes, 11 acres, and we put some of those farmers there. But the reason I'm here today is because I feel that uh, big movement of uh, farmers that are coming, uh, that have long been looking for this opportunity. 
When they saw me, they saw what they needed, and they came all the way to Cambridge. So uh, Agapa, I feel, after introducing this uh, B, uh, SF3841, uh, uh, seeking for funds, uh, is really answering to that call of all the farmers, all the people who are farming backgrounds that have not had that opportunity to farm, to do what they love, to grow the foods they need uh, to grow, cultural or not cultural, because as you can see, most of them also did sell to uh, the local food hubs and the farmers markets. Um, so I, I feel that um, with your support, there, the hundreds of farmers that are out there will be able to be assisted if there's an organized uh, organizations. I started Kilimo and I'm being uh, uh, sponsored by Renewing the Countryside to help these farmers. But that is, I feel it's not enough because it needs a whole village, a whole community to raise, you know, to raise a child or to create this farming community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And next we have a member from the African Growers and Producers Alliance. And then also uh, we have the founder and director of Voice of East African Women. So if both of you could come up, we would appreciate it. And sir, if you'd go ahead and state your name and who you represent, and then if you would uh, proceed with your testimony. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair and members. Uh, my name is Onesmas Mutio. I'm a founding member of AGAPA, African Growers and Producers Alliance. I'm also the president of the Kamba community of Minnesota, so I have a few uh, families behind me that are looking at me with a lot of uh, expectation that something is going to come out of here. Uh, coming from Africa, uh, we come from a farming community, and coming to the U.S., we've been looking for opportunities. And in the last couple of years, I was glad to have connected with somebody like Moses, who has um, offered to mentor me and to point me in the right direction. And I believe I will be able to be able to achieve what he has achieved in the last 12 years within a shorter period because he lacked a mentor, he lacked a guide. Now that he has opened up his uh, skill set and uh, his resources to mentor other farmers, I am a beneficiary and I believe that my community is going to, to benefit as well. Uh, as Senator Fong mentioned, uh, we the government, through the MDA, has been looking for that missing link that is going to help us to uh, achieve um, food production and also an opportunity for equity among the BIPOC community. If you look at the numbers, uh, 55 farmers out of a uh, population representing 6.8% is way too low. And we're not looking for handouts. as. Uh, uh, my, 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 my colleague Ngozi mentioned, we are looking for an opportunity to be able to uh, maximize and add value to the land that is already available, ensuring that we get the technical assistance that is needed, we get resources that are going to make this land uh, as profitable as possible, to incubate farmers, and potentially two or three years later, be able to graduate them to be able to go and stand by themselves, and we continue multiplying this. Uh, if you look at the numbers and, and, and we see 55 farmers being represented uh, in the report and Moses within two years he was able to incubate over 20 farmers, how would it be if we had 20 Moses out there? How would it be if we had um, the resources to make land that, as you can see on slide three and four, you see African uh, women carrying water with buckets on their head. In the next slide we can see a, a long pipe that is being used to, uh, to water the, the land which is there. And yet, two slides down the line, you can see uh, some good produce of, of uh, Swiss chard. You can see some good produce of, of watermelons. If by these uh, meager resources that we have in our hands, we've been able to translate them and make them as profitable as you can see on the later slides, then how much more if we have a stimulus that is going to enable us to at least give people access to resources to better their efforts and to be able to maximize their return. So what I'm saying here is, if I was looking at it as an investment, I would say this is a good investment, secure investment because this money is going through a gatekeeper who's MDA, and there's a huge return. 
small resources turning out 20 farmers, uh, 25 farmers, 30 farmers. I believe if we get these resources within the next four years, we should be able to talk about a few hundreds. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir, for that testimony. I appreciate that. Uh, our next testifier will be Fario Khalif. Would you uh, please uh, say your name for the record and uh, begin your testimony, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Farheel Khalif, and I am with Voice of East African Women. And I would like to thank our uh, supporter and chief author, uh, Senator Von Her. Thank you so much for uh, hearing our voice. I also want to thank all of you um, members who took the time to meet with the group of Agaba the last several weeks. We really appreciate you taking the time to hear the voices of the African immigrants and the African farmers and African-American urban farmers in the state of Minnesota. This is the opportunity we're all looking for. I've been volunteering for the last 10 years, farmers such as Women Environmental Institute. My uncle, who doesn't understand all of this, what I'm doing here, owns a farm in Silver, Silver Lake. He has a 40 acres, and he has the only slaughtering halal meat house in the state of Minnesota. And I see his struggle. I see how hard he works slaughtering the goats to deliver, goes around the, every corner of the state of Minnesota who can buy his meat. But also, while he's doing slaughtering house, he's also farming at the same time. But coming together as Agaba. Agaba is a group of African Alliance farmers, over 20 farmers in the state of Minnesota. This is the opportunity for the state of Minnesota for our voice to be heard. And I'm just here today for your support to ask, please support House File 3841 because it will give more opportunity all the African farmers and African American urban farmers in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, up next, we'll have Ian Wando. Uh, if you'd come up to the test for your table, please. Welcome to the committee, and if you would uh, please state your name for the record and then begin your testimony, please. Yes, thank you so much. My name is uh, Ian Owendo. I am actually part of the um, obviously growing uh, African immigrant community, but specifically uh, within the Ugandan community here in Minnesota. I just want to start by thanking Senator Fong uh, for really taking the time to support this bill, and I also want to thank everybody and all the leaders here uh, who are listening to our voices uh, and hopefully are going to ultimately support this. Um, my, my brothers and sisters have already said what they need to say. I think for me, what I just wanted to add onto that is not, you know, in support of, of, of this bill, um, I remember growing up in Uganda, and I, I often tell this story, but I think it is an important story to tell. And you know when we were playing soccer, and most of us played soccer with no shoes, uh, and every time a plane went by, I'd look up and say, "Man, I wonder where those planes are going." And sometimes I'd say, "You know, hopefully someday I get to get in that plane." And then as time went on, um, you know, I, I got to learn about America and the opportunity that America provides for everybody. And I, I, I would hope and pray that someday I come to America. And it happened, and I came to America. And I've lived in Minnesota since 2005. And I can tell you right now that this is not about a handout. This is about the fabric of our country and what Minnesota is. We work so hard every single day to add to this country and to add to this state. I'm an emerging farmer myself. I grew up watching my mother, you know, uh, healing the land and doing everything. Supporting this bill would not only give us the opportunity to farm, but it would give us the opportunity to live out the same dreams that we grew up wanting to live. And I just really hope that as leaders, you guys give us the opportunity to once again, not only you know, get up every morning and go to work, but also live out the same American dream that everybody and each one of us is waking up every single day and hoping to live. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Awando. Members, uh, questions? I think that concludes our test fire list. Uh, questions, members? 
Senator Friends. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Senator Herr, for an outstanding bill presentation. You should count on this committee's support as much as we can give it. And thanks for the testifiers for coming. The committee has always encouraged the growth of farming in Minnesota, and I hope that we always do. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Thanks, thank Mr. You, Chair. Senator Friends. Thank you, Senator Friends. Other questions, members, comments? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Herr, for bringing the, the bill forward, and thank you for the testifiers. Just a question for you. How long has AGAPA been a nonprofit? When did they become a nonprofit? I'll Senator Herr or Yes, Mr. I'll ask one to testify to come share that. Mr. Chair. Ms. Khalif. Mr. Chair, thank you for the question, Representative uh, Senator. Uh, Agaba been around for the last couple of years, and the group been farming over the last seven years. So, Mr. Chair Anderson. Uh, thank you. So, um, Senator Herr, your testifier, uh, did you incorporate then and become an alliance? Uh, are you marked down as a nonprofit with the state? Yes. Okay. Ms. Not seven years ago? No, no, the, the, the state, yes, it's, it's uh, incorporated. It, yes, um, it is. You, Senator, Senator Anderson. You said you incorporated it seven years ago? No, the group been around for seven years. We incorporated, uh, I think, last year, or late last year. Late last year? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Cleese. Other questions, members? Thank you. Senator Herr, uh, before we uh, lay this over, just do you have an estimate of uh, how many farmers this could could affect or help uh, if, if it was funded at this level? Um, I think um, abundance, you know, as you hear testimony from Ms. Uh, Moses, uh, the uh, farmer that he gathered has grown from 1 to 36, but if you have resource, we have support behind, it will grow um, and, 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 and definite number. Uh, and de so... Um, but Ms. Vario, Ms. Cleese? you're right, yes. uh, Mr. Chair. He's right, and is the African farmers are growing. It's over, almost going more than 30s. Uh, as we grow, as we get more resources, the African farmers are looking for help. Thank you. And, and, and Ms. Cleese, is, do you have an estimate of what you'd look for under this proposal uh, of, of people that it would impact or help uh, in numbers? Mr. Chair, are you asking for? Uh, Funding wise, or just farmers? just if, if it was funded, at the, you're at a four million dollar level in this bill, and that's that's a lot under this committee's jurisdiction. But just if in that ideal world or optimistic, uh, what what would you envision this amount of money could do for helping? Would it be existing farmers uh, that the thirty or thirty six you're talking about, or would it be another dozen or another thirty six, or what 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 would you what would you project or estimate? for the committee to consider? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think uh, it will impact endless number of people. I think uh, farming and growing uh, provide produce uh, throughout our state. So uh, the opportunity uh, for entrepreneurs, the opportunity for farmers uh, will be endless. But this the service, how it, it impacts uh, the, the supply, the foods, go to our school, go to um, the city, um, all over our five million population, I'm sure. And Ms. Ngozi? Yeah, you are you asking about that? the number of farmers? Correct. Okay, yes, we, we are projecting by 2026, we will have about 100 farmers. We would have been able to help 100 farmers. Can you restate the number? I, I didn't hear that. We are projecting that by 2026, we'll be able to serve 100 farmers. 100? Yeah. Okay, very good. No further questions. Uh, thank you, Senator Herr. Uh, thank you to the testifiers. We appreciate you coming in and presenting this to us. Uh, at this point, the committee will lay the bill over for possible inclusion in the Ag Omnibus Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Herr. Uh, Senator Goggin, we're going to put you on the speed show. Um, and then, members, we need to get through the DE, but we have released it publicly. We just want to do a, a, a brief walk through. Senator Goggin, I hate to squeeze you here, but we um, need to hear this high and tight and uh, move right along so we can keep on our agenda. Um, uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Senator Chair. Goggin, and uh, you may proceed and bring your testifiers up if they want. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, I'll be brief here. Um, Senate file 2235 is a one-time appropriation for $100,000 of the Commissioner of Agriculture, uh, which will provide technical assistance and leadership uh, in the development of a comprehensive and well-documented state aquaculture plan. Uh, and this plan would be due to the legislature by February 15 of 2023, which would be next year. So with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to turn it over to our testifiers, if I could, sir. And uh, Clarence Bischoff. Would be Mr. Bischoff, uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, Mr. Skogan on deck. Uh, members or testifiers, we're going to ask to ask you to stay to one minute. Uh, I think you were kind of pre-warned of that, but please, uh, high and tight. And if there's, uh, we've got six of you to go through. Uh, I don't want to short anybody, but we do need to, uh, if there's, it's already been said, just, just briefly reference that. Or if some, yes. somebody's already saying it, just... Yes, uh, I, I understand. And, Mr. Bischoff, uh, tell us yeah. about the bill and identify yourself for the record, please. Yes, I, Clarence Bischoff. I'm the president of the Minnesota Aquaculture Association. And uh, I'm, first of all, I want to thank you for taking some time to talk about aquaculture. I want to thank uh, Senator Gargan for bringing forward this uh, bill, uh, Senate File 2235. Uh, in the interest of time, I've uh, provided my testimony as a PDF document so that we can move uh, to our first testifier, uh, Dan Skogan of AURI. Mr. Skogan, welcome. Identify yourself for the record and uh, can have your next testifier ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the committee. Dan Skogan, Director of Government and Industry Relations for AURI, the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. Uh, last year, AURI released its aquaculture report entitled Minnesota Aquaculture Challenges and Opportunities. It outlined many of the elements that an aquaculture industry in our state will need to address. The report also identified several significant hurdles, including pairing species with effective production systems, developing disease management uh, protocols, identifying cost-effective fish meal alternatives, navigating complex and changing regulatory systems, having access to meaningful market and value-added research, and obtaining investment capital and or debt financing, and establishing economically viable operations. We are also, of course, at AURI interested in uh, uh, soy meal, uh, biofuels, distillers, grain feeds for fish feed, industrial heat and hot water for indoor aquaculture as well as aquaponics. And uh, we just uh, feel that the uh, bill that uh, Senator Goggin has brought forward will help us move in a positive direction for aquaculture around the state of Minnesota. Thank you, uh, Mr. Skogan. And uh, Mr. Schreiner is next with uh, Karen Clark on deck. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon. Identify and yourself you, for the record. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yep, thank you uh, for uh, allowing me to testify in support of SF 2235. My name is Don Schreiner. I'm a fisheries aquaculture specialist with Minnesota Sea Grant. <clears throat> Minnesota Sea Grant is a federal university partnership program. Sea Grant is not an advocate for aquaculture, but we do fund, develop, and transfer the science about aquaculture to interested stakeholders. Minnesota Sea Grant was asked by the Minnesota Aquaculture Association to discuss the need for a revised aquaculture plan for Minnesota, and we are not here on behalf of the University of Minnesota. Aquaculture in Minnesota um, is composed of the bait industry, fish for stocking, and food fish. It's about a $5 million industry. About half of that value goes to bait, about 25% each to stocking and food fish. Food fish in aquaculture is growing in importance in Minnesota. In 2017, Minnesota Sea Grant hosted a two-day workshop focused on food fish aquaculture. 15 seconds. Participants from um, agencies, government, and academia. One of the things that came out is that we felt that we needed a comprehensive aquaculture plan for Minnesota. The last one was done 32 years ago. And if legislators and citizens want to move forward with aquaculture in the state, we strongly believe a revised plan is necessary. Happy to answer any questions in a question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schreiner. Uh, Karen Clark, a familiar face to many of us. Uh, welcome. Identify yourself for the record. And uh, Mr. Thiel, uh, cool. on deck. Thank you, Senator Westrom and committee members. I'll, I'll be brief. I did submit some written testimony and it gives you some more details, but let me just say that I'm here in support of uh, Senate File 2235. We need this uh, aquaculture plan in the state of Minnesota. 
I'm here um, as a, the uh, volunteer executive director of the Women's Environmental Institute and a board member of the East Phillips Neighborhood Institute, uh, which is a um, South Minneapolis community organization uh, working to create an indoor urban farm in Minneapolis. And aquaculture are, is a, a venture that we do in each of, each of these facilities. Uh, or will do in uh, South Minneapolis if we can get it created. Um, WI teaches people how to uh, build their own affordable version of a closed loop um, aquaculture structure. Um, and I'll just say it's a way to both grow fish and vegetables and there's no waste water created. Um, we are working with the Nawahi Center School in South Minneapolis, working with native youth who are learning how to build that kind of a structure. And I want to just leave you with one really important um, concept, which is uh, we believe that aquaculture uh, can be a very important rural and urban uh, strategy for helping families and others learn to grow their own fish, a clean food fish uh, for them, both urban and rural and suburban. And I really hope that this uh, aquaculture plan, which we, are, we need to have funded, will be able to address all of those var varieties. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Clark. Uh, Mr. Tholey, I mispronounced your name. I apologize. And then uh, Mr. Dahl. Mr. Davolis will be next or last. So, Mr. Tholey, identify yourself for the record. Welcome to the committee. Mr. One Chairman, minute, please. committee members, uh, senators, um, my name is Barry Tholey. I own and operate Lincoln Bait. I have for 35 years in central Minnesota Staples. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today to address the need for an aquaculture plan for Minnesota. <clears throat> my name is Barry Tholey and my company Lincoln Bait has operated since 1987 as a wholesale bait dealer for over 35 years and a fish farm owner for 23 of those years. As I see it, we are faced with a dilemma in the bait industry in Minnesota. The wild resource we have relied on for decades is failing us. Uh, invasive species, parasites, have further declined that resource, and it is our, <clears throat> and with it, our ability to provide bait fish needed for fishing um, in Minnesota. Widespread shortages were seen this winter of several of the best known bait fish. Um, aquaculture is the answer to those shortages to provide enough bait for fishermen and for forage market for benefits, for the benefits of Minnesota businesses and provide opportunities for in and for Minnesota. I have worked diligently for decades to find ways to grow bait fish for Minnesota in Minnesota. We now have a better knowledge of these species than ever before, bringing the industry into a modern age will require education, help, and investment in order to provide opportunities for new businesses and new jobs. I thank you for the opportunity to present my, my perspective and welcome the opportunity to address any questions and concerns. Thank Very you. good. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, testimony, Mr. Tholis. Uh, oh. Mr. De Devani? De 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 Dean Devolis. Devolis. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Uh, identify yourself and uh, go ahead. One minute, Thank please. You. Mr. Chairman, committee members, my name is Dean Devolis. I'm the board chair of Blue Otter Farms and also the board president of East Phillips Neighborhood Institute. I'm here to testify on really the inner city opportunity this bill could give. This is not just a rural situation, but we've had strong interest from the Native American community, the East African community, the Latinas community in aquaculture. Many tenants along Lake Street express being part of the facility and credit to Clarence Bischoff, Blue Water Farms has made a commitment to move into the East Phillips neighborhood also, which is a very heavily BIPOC community. So the emphasis I want to make is that this is not just a rural issue, but a significant urban issue and can really open an opportunity across all races, across all cultures, and really be a great benefit uh, for Minnesota. So I stand in support for this bill. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. DeVolis. Uh, any other persons came to testify for or against this? Questions, members? Brief questions? Very good. Uh, Senator uh, Goggin, uh, in the interest of time, we will lay this bill over for possible inclusion in the agri omnibus bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, members. Thank you to those of you that uh, were able to come in and testify. I appreciate that. Members, uh, last, we're going to get our DE amendment uh, as drafted uh, out. It's been public uh, for several hours now today. 
uh, but I'm going to ask our staff to just walk through it. I don't think we're going to get to comments from the Department of Ag even today, but I want everyone to just at least get the high level quick walk through and then uh, we can uh, you can look at it more uh, after we adjourn. But uh, with that, uh, Hannah Grunwald, uh, we'll start with you and then uh, go to Ms. Painter from Senate Council to walk through the policy side. Uh, Mr. Chair and, Han and members, uh, this is Hannah Grunwald, fiscal analyst. I'll walk through the DE amendment to Senate File 4019. Uh, articles 1 and 2 have appropriations in them. And in the spreadsheets that are being handed out right now, uh, I'll just walk through the changes that show up there. Overall, there's a $5 million increase one time uh, in fiscal year 22-23 biennium. And that is from the general fund. So starting on the spreadsheet uh, with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, line six shows the DE has a $50,000 increase for Forever Green in fiscal year 23. Line eight shows farm safety grants amendment, which is, uh, doesn't have any appropriation effects, but just carries over the first year to the second year or allows the agency to use first year funds in the second year. Line 11 uh, is a $700,000 increase in fiscal year 23 for AGRI livestock processing facility grants. Line 19 uh, is a $1 million appropriation to information technology modernization. Line 20 shows a one time $500, excuse me, $500,000 uh, appropriation in fiscal year 22 to the emergency AG account. Line 28 is a $500,000 appropriation to the Egg Innovation Campus. Line 30 shows a $1 million appropriation to uh, reimburse certain white-tailed white deer farmers, uh, up to 5,000 per farmer. Um, and then any leftover funds can be appropriated on a pro-rata basis by the commissioner. Line 31 shows a $100,000 appropriation in the first year for the veterinary diagnostic laboratory equipment. Line 32 shows a $10,000 one-time appropriation for a regional and local food systems report. Line 33 shows a $50,000 appropriation for the new Egg BMP grant program, which is established in this amendment in uh, Article 3, I believe. Line 34 shows a one-time $1 million appropriation for meat cutting in secondary schools. Line 35 shows a $50,000 appropriation for cover crop grants. Uh, $10,000 in the first year is appropriated for the state agriculture plan. And finally, the uh, line 37 shows a $30,000 appropriation in fiscal year 23 for uh, meat processors to get their safety training reimbursed. And I'll just mention there's one language change in the uh, Article 1 on page 13, paragraph D, for the farmer mental health grant language. Um, the appropriation stays the same, but the uh, money is directed to Region 5 Development Commission. Then on the second page of the spreadsheet, just try to go through this quickly here. If you skip down to line 66, you'll see uh, broadband development funds from the federal government. Uh, Article 2 of the DE includes uh, direction for the Department of Employment and Economic Development to apply for $110 million of the Capital Projects Fund to go towards the Border to Border Broadband Program. And on the very last page of the spreadsheet, page five, I believe, breaks down some of the allowable spending of federal broadband dollars. So you'll see the Capital Projects Fund, 110 million shows up on line 150. And on line 151, um, any IIJA or infrastructure bill broadband funds are directed to uh, the Office of Broadband. And then lines 154, uh, 153 through 156 show some allowable spending. First, up to 15 million of either of those federal dollars can be used towards a lower density pilot program also established 
in, section, in Article 3 of this DE, and then up to $15 million for a broadband line extension program established in this DE, and up to $15 million towards comprehensive, comprehensive statewide mapping, if allowable under federal guidelines. And uh, Mr. Chair, that wraps up the appropriation articles. I can turn it over to Ms. Painter. Very good. Ms. Painter, uh, we'll let you do a speed read as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank Go you, ahead. Mr. Chair and members. Um, Section 1 clarifies that identifying personal data is private for those who contact the Minnesota Farm and Rural Helpline. That's effective immediately. Section 2 establishes a grant program to help finance new cooperatives that organize to operate a processing facility or to market an agricultural product or service. Section 3 establishes an agriculture best management practices grant program to support healthy soil management practices. Sections 4 through 8 amend the agriculture best, best management practices loan program. Um, these were technical changes from the Department of Agriculture. Section 9 amends the maximum reimbursement payments from the agricultural chemical response and reimbursement account, um, raising it incrementally every couple of years from 350,000 um, until it reaches 575,000 in fiscal year 2027. Section 10 states that the Commissioner of Natural Resources has concurrent authority to regulate farmed white-tailed deer in conjunction with the Board of Animal Health and stipulates that neither entity can issue an emergency stop movement order without the concurrence of the other. Section 11 allows solar energy generating system producing one megawatt or less to be installed on agriculture preserve land. Section 12 clarifies the eligibility for the Oriented Strand Board production incentive. Um, this again was a technical change from the Department of Agriculture. Section 13 changes the exemption for grain buyers, so those who purchase with cash are exempt from bond requirements regardless of the amount of purchases. Section 14 changes the threshold of accounting reviews for grain buyers from $5 million to $7.5 million. Section 15 allows institutions accredited by the Zoological Association of America to possess regulated animals. And then in Article 4, uh, there's a broadband policy. Section 1 establishes the Broadband Line Extension Program, um, awarding grants to extend broadband to unserved locations. Section 2 allows the border-to-border -border broadband account to be used for the Line Extension Program. And Section 3 allows broadband service providers to use existing utility easements for broadband installation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank you. Uh, both, uh, both for your walkthrough, um, members, questions, uh, discussion. I guess that's pretty much our. Any quick comments? Otherwise, uh, members, uh, we'll start with probably the Department of Ag. Uh, any clarifications, members? Otherwise, uh, that is the walkthrough, members, as I said earlier. We will um, uh, entertain this DE on uh, Wednesday with uh, further uh, comment from uh, the Department of Ag or other groups um, uh, and any changes thereof. So that's uh, our Wednesday agenda. And uh, if needed, we'd probably go into the Wednesday evening. But members, I think we can get it through, get it through on uh, our full committee time on Wednesday. But that would be our backup plan if needed. So with no further questions or comments, thank you all for your indulgence. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>